Welcome to the Writing Gym Podcast. We're here to pump up your writing. And now your host, Andy Brixey, personal trainer at the Writing Gym. Hey there, writers and news daters. Enjoy the fifth part of our Six Secrets series this week. Have you been feeling like you have a lot of writer's block? Do you have so many ideas but can never manage to get them onto paper? Is overcoming fear in your writing a challenge for you? Then this episode is for you. Enjoy and happy writing. Annalisa, why don't you walk me through some of the various emotions that writers have when they first come to you about their work? When writers first come to me to talk about their work, it's really interesting because they start to talk about their concrete problems, right? Like they want to finish a manuscript, but they can't. They've got a story to tell, but they don't know how. Uh, They sit down to write, but then they can't remember or they don't know what they want to say. Many of them will... (laughs) write a chapter and intend, you know, the next day to write chapter two, but then they're revising chapter one all over again. Um, A lot of them will join, you know, writing groups and then feel really frustrated because it's not getting them to the ends that they want. Um, So it's very concrete at first. And then as we move deeper into our conversations about what's really going on for them, what ends up happening is we're at a point where we start to talk about the real feelings that they're having. And a lot of times these manifest themselves as fears. So they talk about, you know, I don't know if my writing is good enough. I don't know who if anyone would ever want to hear my story, who am I to tell my story? Who am I to put myself out there? Uh, you know, I'm afraid if people read this, I'm afraid that people will hate this. I'm afraid that people will love this. I'm afraid to see my name on a book. I can't wait to see my name on a book. It scares me to death to see my name on a book. So they're facing a lot of fears. And, you know, the third thing that comes up a lot of times are things that they've been carrying for a really long time. You know, my third grade teacher said I was a terrible storyteller, a terrible writer, my mom, my grandma, my neighbor, you know, the kid who sat next to me in journalism class in high school. I mean, all of this stuff comes up from the past as we start to think through, you know, ultimately, where is this critic coming from? Uh, You know, in, in a lot of cases, it's a, it's a family history of, you know, we were always told not to talk about our problems, not to tell our stories, not to put ourselves out there. Um, people have these things that they've been carrying for a really long time that are getting in the way of what they want to do for themselves, whether it's to, you know, tell a memoir, something that actually happened to them, to tell a story in fiction, or, you know, that hybrid genre in between of creative nonfiction where they're uh, telling a real story in an imagined way. Regardless of the genre that they're looking to communicate through, uh, these fears are really, really real for so many writers. So how, how does that fear hold them back? Yeah, I mean, in some cases, it can be debilitating and then exacerbated by modern, more recent experiences that they've had in their lives. So, for example, you know, let's take anybody writer who had this third grade teacher who said they'd never be a writer uh, or were a terrible writer or couldn't tell stories. And then this person, you know, gets up enough courage and says, oh, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to join this writing group. And suddenly the feedback is the wrong kind of feedback and puts that writer right back into that place of, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so said I would never be a writer. It's absolutely true. And all these people in my group say I'm also not a writer, so I must not be a writer. And they stop. How many times have I seen this? Uh, Andy, you've seen some of it too, where these people, they just, they haven't written for months. They haven't written for years. They put down the pen. uh, They stop their story. I mean, we have heard some really terrible stories of things that people have been through, things that have gotten in people's way um, of having a voice, 
of telling their story, which, you know, I believe, as you know, is a fundamental right of our existence to be able to, to share with others our experience and what we've done, what we've learned, what we've loved, what we've hated, whatever those stories are to get those out. And yet so much is getting in the way. Yes, it's definitely something that, you know, we've both come across and they get, they get locked in this, this negative mindset, just stuck in, you know, like you said, that, that third grade teacher, what they said, that, you know, what the feedback that they received in that group, the, you know, time on the playground when somebody said this, and it's, it's amazing the, the emotions and the stuff that that kind of brings up. Um, so, you know, obviously that negative mindset isn't, a good place to be in, you know, that place of fear and, you know, bringing up these, these past memories. So what kind of mindset should people be in when they write? That's a really good question. Um, and, and it's not as easy as it, as it might appear, right? If we just say, Oh, you know, be positive. <laughs> uh, it's not, it's not that easy. So the strategy that we implement in the writing gym is to face those fears head on and to accept them as real. You know, the third grade might have been a long time ago, but that doesn't make that memory any less painful. Uh, or even the thing that happened a year ago or the time that your mom said or your dad said or that you thought to yourself, whatever it is, those are real. Those are real fears. And there are ways to work through those fears so that the writer can be successful and really get to a point where we've changed the mindset, we've altered the mindset. And I don't mean like a patch or a Band-Aid. I mean really establishing new patterns, not just in our lives, but in our brains, where we're interfacing with the world, with criticism, with our own inner critic in a totally new way. So that, uh, as I've said many times, we know when to invite the inner critic in for dinner and when to close the door in her face. Because sometimes she can be useful. She, my inner critic is a she, maybe <laughs> you're a she. Uh, sometimes she can be useful, but most times it's time to say, not now, inner critic. And so, you know, I call that being in right relationship with your inner critic. We're not trying to get rid of the inner critic. Please do not try to get rid of your inner critic. You need the inner critic. Your inner critic is the thing that keeps you from getting run over in traffic. Do not get rid of your inner critic. Um, <laughs> however, you know, she, she, he, it, whatever yours is, uh, has a time and a place to be in your life. And so getting into right relationship with your inner critic is essential to being able to, to write and be happy about it um, and, and move through. And, and while, while I'm on that of like being happy about it, right, we have this uh, romantic cliche of, of the suffering artist and, and Hemingway, and, you know, all of this. And you, you don't have to be a suffering artist. I mean, you can if that's what you want to be when you grow up, but you don't have to be. You could be someone who lives in creative flow and really um, gets fed energetically off your writing. So you mentioned um, rewiring your brain to, to have a more positive relationship with your writing. Um, so on the subject of rewiring your brain, how is this change in mindset based in your study of neuroscience? That's a really great question. So, um, you know, your brain is uh, a com complex system that evolved uh, over many millennia of uh, the human evolution. And so what we know in science now are the parts of the brain that are the oldest parts of the brain. In other words, they've been uh, with thinking beings for a very long time. Now this is oversimplified, but I'm going to assume that our listeners, you know, like haven't been reading fMRIs and, you know, checking out brain scans and things. So, um, you know, to really simplify it, if we think about, um, the different parts of the brain. What we're really talking about here are your reptilian brain, the oldest part of your brain, in case you're really curious, that's the part that's at the top of your spine, the back of your head, um, your limbic system and your neocortex, which is behind your forehead. So um, if we think about that illustration as a chocolate covered cherry, 
And we put that reptilian brain as the cherry. And we have the limbic system, and that's the little like sweet juice that's in the cherry. And then the neocortex is the chocolate covering. Then we've got, you know, like if you think about rings of a tree, then we've sort of got like the oldest part in the middle and the new middle part in the middle and the newest part on the outside. So that's just an illustration for you. And I'm sorry if I made you all hungry and everyone's having a craving now for chocolate covered ears. <laughs> um, but that's just an illustration. And the reason that we care about that is because of the interrelationship between those parts of the brain and what we were made to do. So on a really basic level, you know, when we're threatened, the oldest part of our brain reads that threat. So if you see a lion, well, then you probably don't live where I live. But if you see a lion, then your brain just says, run, right? Especially if it's chasing you, like run from the lion. That's a threat. It wants to eat you. And your brain should do that for you. You need that part. Where we get into trouble, and that's called the flight or fight or flight response, right? We're either going to fly from the lion or we are going to fight the lion. Do not fight the lion. That's a bad choice. And your brain knows that. And so it puts into gear, all right, let's go. Now, the newer parts of the brain are where we're able to process. So if we see something that's threatening, we might say, oh, is that really a threat? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, right? We don't, we, these are the sort of medium threats. So let's say you're in a parking lot at the supermarket and, you know, a cart is rolling towards you, right? It might hurt you, but this is not a major threat. You can say, okay, so I can stop the cart or I can move to the side, right? You can kind of process that versus the fight or flight. What happens in a lot of writers' brains, however, is that because of this emotional response that we were just talking about previously, where things are really deep-seated in people's minds and people's psyches, is that they've already created a response where when someone says what Mr. Smith told you in the third grade, boom, you're into fight or flight, you don't function, right? Like it, whenever you've had that response in your life, it probably wasn't a lion, but you know, maybe you saw a dangerous situation or you were in a fire or a forest fire or something was chasing you, you know, or even when you were a kid playing tag, you got this sort of like high heart rate uh, response. You're not thinking. Adrenaline kicks in and you know, you're either fighting or you're fleeing. Those are the choices. So what happens in a non-imminently dangerous situation when we get into fight or flight is the same physiological response. Except now, there's no lion, there's no knife, it's me and a bunch of writers in my writing group, and I can't function. So if I'm in that response, I am not being a creative person. I am not being a productive person. I probably can't even communicate really well to respond to people because I'm in fight or flight. I might fight, right? I might say, you big jerks, I can't believe you, right? I might sort of fight against that. That might be my impulse. I might, you know, slam down my books and storm out of the room. That's flight. But nothing productive can physiologically happen for me right now because I've been what's called emotionally hijacked. And so many writers put themselves in this scenario where they're perpetually emotionally hijacked. Well, guess what? They're not gonna be creative because they simply can't. It is physically impossible for them to be creative in that state. And that's, that's the brain science of, of what happens to us when we live in fear, when we're perpetually in fear, and we, we ha haven't got a strategy to get out of it. So with that in mind, you know, the, the, the lockdown of fight or flight and a, and a writer being in that situation, unable to produce, how much change does that shift in mindset really make to the writer and the creative process? Oh, it's huge. It's huge, right? So if you can think about what, what it would be like to, instead of sending that image or that impulse to the reptilian brain, to be able to process it in the neocortex, 
uh, which, you know, so we're, we're reprogramming the brain. We're sending an impulse somewhere else in the brain because of the reprogramming that we've been able to do. And, you know, who cares about neuroscience? We care about writing a novel. So what are the real results that writers see in our program? Because we're not saying, okay, so now we're going to reprogram the synopsis. <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing that. Um, you know, <laughs> what we're doing is we're creating scenarios. We're creating situations where the conditions are right for new neural pathways to be created that will overwrite, again, I'm simplifying, but will overwrite these old neural pathways that were created a long time ago so that, you know, it's a new person, it's a new writer, it's a new experience. And, and so many of our writers have had this experience where they came in and they were sort of, you know, carried in this big old knapsack of baggage from the past and they were able to get into right relationship with, with the things that they were carrying, with um, you know, the things that they wanted to keep with them, and, and with that inner critic. Yeah, it's funny. Um, when, it, when you're talking about all these various scenarios, I can't help but think, um, as, the, as the personal trainer in the writing gym, mindset is what I focus on. It's what we talk about every single week. It's you know, kind of how I help them work through to, uh, to find, you know, in, in your fancy pants words, the different neural pathways. Um, but it's funny, we have um, so many writers that I've seen such huge changes in. Uh, we, have, we have one writer in the program, um, I won't do names, we'll call her B. Um, and she came into the program with, you know, so much baggage when it came to, you know, emotional baggage when it came to her writing so much anxiety and fear, you know, every single time she, she sat down at her computer to work, it was, you know, it, this isn't enough. This isn't going to be good enough. And she was so terrified all the time. And she really, you know, couldn't break out of that and, you know, ended up feeling so frustrated and, you know, calling it writer's block saying, well, I felt really blocked today. But when you unpack that and go back to, you know, well, why, why do you feel blocked? And, you know, breaking down the fact that, you know, she was, she was in fear. It was that fight or flight. It was her negative experience with other writing programs and things that had led her to have this block, to have this fear. And it just had, you know, put that wall between her and the work that she wanted to do. And, you know, now she's working on her revisions of her draft and doing amazing. So it's so awesome to, you know, see that part of it. And then we have people in the program. Um, we have a particular writer. Um, we'll call him Jay. Uh, who didn't even know he was scared. You know, he, he went through the whole program. He felt like he was doing really well. You know, he was making big progress on, on, his, on his novel. Everything was going a-okay. And then he came, into, he came into a meeting one week and was just like, I didn't get anything done. I don't know why. I don't know what happened. I just, nothing happened this week. You know, I just, you know, had a bad week. And then once again, when you start to unpack and rewind, you know, what happened, it turned out that, he had that fear too. You know, he was in that negative mindset. He had gotten to the point where he could see the end of the tunnel. He could see the end of his novel and that fight or flight kicked in where it said, you know, what if, what if you're not good enough? What if this book isn't good enough? What if this doesn't end the way you want it to? What if this is all wrong? And so in that fight or flight, you know, his brain just shut down and he couldn't get anything done. Um, and now, you know, in, in the most recent meeting with him, he not only sees the end of his novel, but is working on it and will have a completed draft in, I think, two weeks now, which is really exciting. Um, and because I'm 90% sure I know who you're talking about, um, <laughs> he today was so committed to his author lifestyle dream that he created his author website and his social media presence today because oh. he knew how close that dream was. I mean, that's one heck of a transition. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. amazing. It's huge. And I mean, we even had writers in the past, um, we had an author, we'll, we'll call him A, uh, 
And he, he spent the entire program having a lot of struggles with, with confidence, you know, being in that mindset of you're not good enough. This isn't good enough. You know, this, you're not going to be able to do this well. Um, and just, you know, shutting, shutting down at a lot of points and trying to, you know, work through this fear and be in a more positive mindset. Um, and not only did he work through his fear to be in a more positive mindset, but now because of the rewiring of those pathways, he is confidently submitting to writing contests on a regular basis um, because he has that positive relationship with his work now. He's no longer sitting at his desk panicking that he's not good enough. He's saying, I can do this and having the ability to do it. So it's, you know, when we say that this change makes a huge difference to a writer, you know, these authors are the testament to this. You know, people that in the beginning of the programs were blocked and unable and having a really hard time that, you know, now have first drafts and are working on revisions, are setting up author platforms, are submitting to writing contests, have finished drafts. It's huge. It's Absolutely. huge. And, you know, as you're describing those people, you know, the analogy, because I'm an analogy girl, uh, the analogy that comes to mind is, you know, if you ever had a job that you hated, right, you just dreaded, like, oh, it's Monday, like, I have to go work today, I'm going to see that person, I'm going to have to do that task, whatever it is, um, you just drudge the day, you count the seconds until it's done, it just, like, that feeling right, of like carrying that, how heavy that is. And I'm sure everyone can relate. Everyone's had something like that in their lives versus, you know, something completely different, right? When you fall in love and you've just met someone and you know that you're in love and you're going to see them on Saturday night, like how that feels. And like on Wednesday, you're thinking about, you know, what's Saturday going to be like? I'm going to wear that, those jeans or those jeans, you know, or those shoes or those shoes. Um, you know, you, you can't wait that anticipation of, of what's going to happen and you're so excited and it's amazing. And that's the transition that we've seen. It's, and it's not just about, you know, how many pages they write or how many websites or how, like, it's not about the things. The things are amazing and the things are wonderful. It's about the freedom. It's about lifting that weight off of their shoulders so that they can become the writers that they were meant to be and do the thing that they were passionate about doing without carrying that heavy burden, but being light and enjoying and loving what they're doing. Yeah. And I think that the, the biggest part of that is for me is the fact that I've never, I've never seen this particular aspect in any writing program, um, in any that I've signed up for or gone through any that I've heard of from others. I mean, you know, I've attended the, the, Writers Digest annual conference with you several times, and we talk about multiple writing programs with authors from all over there. And I've never, I've never heard mention of a of a comprehensive program like the Writing Gym that covers this mindset aspect of it. That kind of sees the writer as you know a whole person and says, you know, hey, we know you got some baggage, so let's figure out how to how to move past that baggage and create a really positive relationship with your creativity so that moving forward, you know, you can do anything that you want and be the writer that you truly want to be. Yeah, you're right, Andy. And it's, it's not, it's not a gratuitous way. We spend one third of our time working on mindset. That's huge. It's a huge investment in the writer, in the author, and how much we care about people and the longevity of their writing careers, that they really can create that author lifestyle for them. So, you know, you and I have talked in, in the past about elements of, of the writing gym, how we're dedicated to quality craft, how we're dedicated to... Um, the marketability of a piece, how we're dedicated to our relationships that we have with literary agents and publishers and editors and really making sure that the pieces that we're submitting are up to the standards that those professionals are looking for. Those are all really huge, important parts of the program. Of course they are. And seeing that author, as you say, as a whole person who has needs and fears and desires and needs a plan for how to become a successful author, that is something that makes our program unique 
And I would attribute our incredibly high success rate around publication, multiple publications, um, and happy writers, dang it, <laughs> to the fact that we, we do uh, do things the way that we do things, to use do in a sentence eight times. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Annalisa, thank you so much for having this conversation um, with me and with our listeners. And of course, just like always, when you guys check out the show notes, if you want to have a conversation with one of the members of the Writing Gym Success team and talk about your writing and how your mindset is and how we can help you with that, I will put a link in that in the show notes. Have a fantastic day or night wherever you are and happy writing. If you like what you've heard and are interested to see if you're the right fit for the writing gym, here's what to do next. Head to www.datewiththemuse.com slash publish now and book an appointment to speak with our team. Here's how it works. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes and we'll get crystal clear on three things. The best way for you to publish, the best way to achieve your publishing dream, and the exact strategy you should be using to reach your publishing goals. Remember, Publishing a book well doesn't happen on its own. You need expert guidance to make it happen. We've helped writers all over the world to finish, publish, and sell their novels well, all while sharing their unique story and making the world a better place along the way. To see if we can help you to do the same, head to www.datewiththemuse.com slash publish now. I'm Andy, personal trainer over in the writing gym, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. Happy writing. And hey, since you listened all the way to the very, very end of the episode, here's this week's little quirk of the week. A little blooper reel, but not. I don't want to be a rat, but Annalisa is terrible at bowling. She usually can't break 100 in her score, but she always has the most fantastic time doing it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>